Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. Okay, so today's video is going to be the second video I've done on a fully restored now two-speed adjustable feed uh, one horsepower hand cranked Acme post drill. Wow, what a mouthful. Uh, so the uses of these post drills, I see a lot of people restoring them on YouTube, but ironically, they're, uh, they're woodworkers. Uh, now these drills can be used for wood uh, quite easily, <clears throat> but they're primarily designed uh, to be mounted on a post, hence the word post drill, in a blacksmith shop uh, and his forge uh, to drill holes through metal. Um, yeah, so they're primarily for uh, for wood, or sorry, for metal, but it can be used for wood. <clears throat> so how does this thing work? Well, let's see if I can <clears throat> kind of break it down for you. So in the middle here, you have your, uh, your spindle assembly, and you have these three gears here, and you have another bevel gear underneath here that's attached to the, uh, that's attached to the spindle itself. Up here you have a feed wheel and on top of that you have a paw that is linked to an arm the ride the other end of it rides right here along the elliptical boss of this the inside of this flywheel okay so <clears throat> What happens is the craftsman turns the hand wheel, rotating this gear, which then, in, of course, rotates this one, which is coupled to this one, and it turns that uh, bevel gear that is uh, keyed onto the shaft of the spindle and turns the drill bit. Now, that only turns the drill bit, that's one part of the equation, it still has to go down. <clears throat> well, going down on the other end of this shaft is the flywheel. On that flywheel, that arm rides along its elliptical boss right there and moves this, <clears throat> moves this paw forward. So you can see it's kind of, I need to do some tweaking on this. The more I tighten up right now, it, it uh, freezes up the arm and won't let it ride, but <clears throat> you can still see the demonstration here. When I move it, when I crank it, it goes, catches those teeth and moves. And when it moves, it rides down this screw and, and in turn pushes this entire spindle assembly in the downward direction. <clears throat> now, I'll move you back over to this side real quick and show you. It'll work better without the height. <clears throat> that whoever made this put. <laughs> Whoever designed it where this thumb screw right here uh, was right in front of that screw, I'd like to kick his ass. But you can either turn it this way, which is going to be about two-thirds of the rotation that you get. <clears throat> so, in other words, moving it, uh, spinning the spindle slower. Then if you put it right here, you just take this, you loosen up that pull and you put it down onto this gear which is coupled directly to coupled directly to the one gear that is driving the bevel gear on the other side <clears throat> right there and Therefore, it's just one to one, right? So, <clears throat> so this is slower and this is faster. 
Now I'm going to take this back off because I want to move slow. I like drilling slow. And yes, we are going to be doing a demo. But I wanted to go over a few of the functions of this thing first. So there you go. You have your adjustable feed. And you have your adjustable speed. <clears throat> this is both parts of the equation. Uh, okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about, I got a list right here. Uh, uses, how it works, mounting it. Okay. So I brought you down here so hopefully you can see. When I went... <clears throat> The first thing that I did was I, I milled out a new piece of oak, which is about five feet tall. <clears throat> um, it is seven quarter wide and uh, thick and seven quarter or seven inches wide. <clears throat> I, I didn't I didn't mean to do it that way. It just ended up with sevens, <laughs> which is pretty typical for almost all my work. I don't know how, but it always ends up with um, seven or multiples of seven. Um, <clears throat> so I milled out, or I, you know, I, I planed down, uh, worked the, uh, the plank and I got it all, all trued up and ready to go <clears throat> for the mounting. And then I mounted, I mounted the frame <clears throat> of this headstock first. I got everything as true as I could, making sure that the spindle was, uh, <clears throat> was parallel with the board. And uh, this way, and then I got it mounted, and then it kind of sat for a little bit because <clears throat> I needed to. Uh, I still needed to uh, to work the tailpiece, and I needed time. <clears throat> um, so after I mounted this, I let it sit, and then I went back to it uh, yesterday and today, and. I mounted this tailpiece. Now the tailpiece is the tricky part. It's the <clears throat> the one part of this whole uh, process that can screw you if you're not paying attention to it. <clears throat> because these frames and these pieces to the frame are so, um, what's the word, sloppy. Uh, there's very, there's a whole lot of, uh, or I should say very little uh, tolerance when these uh, machines were made. <clears throat> um, all the, the frame and, and all the, these pieces are all like casting and so they're all going to be off a little bit. It may look cattywampus or it may sit, uh, you know, like this bar sits in this cup down here, this, this uh, mounting bracket at the bottom of the post. The bar sits in it crooked. Uh, so when you tighten it up, if you were to just have it freestanding and tighten it up, that bar is going to be straight up and down and that foot's going to be crooked. <clears throat> so I did do a little bit of shimming here and there to keep it kind of, you know, when I tightened it, it will still kind of look uh, the way it should. Um, <clears throat> but I made sure that this, this uh, bolt right here that tightens the table was tight. It was fixed. This nut here was tight. I slid the bar assembly in. I made sure that this foot was tight. This nut or bolt right here was tight on the foot. And then I inserted it into the into the uh, bottom. And then <clears throat> I tightened it down. Now, but before I tightened it down up here, what I had to do was put the chuck that I'm going to use. If you're going to use a chuck, you use this, you know, you use the chuck you're going to use. If not, then you use the, if you're going to use the original chuck that comes with it, then uh, either way, make sure the face of the chuck is perfectly parallel with the table. <clears throat> um, not just this way, but also this way. <clears throat> The only way that you're going to be able to change this way, well, or this way really, but mainly this way, is by 
modifying like I have, like I had to do. Well, I, I can't take it off for you right now because it's all set up, ready to go. But on the bottom, there's <clears throat> you have basically three contact points. You have little contact points underneath here where it, it ride where it rides uh, on the top of this frame, and then you have one contact point back here, right below, or sorry, right uh, behind where that shaft goes through your uh, your mounting bolt for the table. Uh, those three points, you can file a little bit here and there to get it to kind of sit the way you want it. But you can, and you can also use it for, for uh, getting it parallel this way. Um, but also, getting it parallel this way is all a matter of swinging it, <clears throat> and it all depends on where you uh, where you mount, or all that's going to be dictated on how you bolt this down. So I get it off. I got it really, really close. I drilled the holes through there. I got everything almost to where it was uh, snugged up. Then I, you know, I snugged it up just a hair, just where I could still beat it one way or another. And then squared this face to this face, and then uh, ran the uh, lag screws <clears throat> uh, the rest of the way down, tightening it all up. All right, so that was the mounting. Um, I did. I was able to get it to where this whole assembly looks. It appears, you know, because this is straight vertical, and now this looks straight vertical. It's not perfect, but it's pretty damn close. So I'm happy with the mounting on this, <clears throat> on the new uh, the new baseboard here. Um, and I'm really, really stoked how this turned out. Uh, next thing. Ugh. All right, maintenance. <clears throat> so, when it comes to maintenance on these, man, that light really sucks. It's a little bit better. All right. <clears throat> So, maintenance on these guys. There's not a whole lot of maintenance going on, but there is some oiling and some greasing. Or at least I oiled and greased. <clears throat> uh, when it comes to oil, I wanted some really thick stuff, so I got some 140 weight. And I'm going to point out your oiling spots. Besides all the... the uh, Exposed metal surfaces, you're going to want to put a light coat of at least, you know, some kind of like three in one, some kind of light machine oil. <clears throat> but your oiling spots, you have one oil spot right here at the uh, on the boss of the flywheel that lubricates the shaft going between. Um, <clears throat> and you also have an oil spot right here. You have an oil spot right here on the top of this gear. So both gears that are fixed, remember these are screwed in and don't move. Those shafts are uh, fixed. But obviously the gears are not. <clears throat> so you get oil there, oil there, oil back there. And then there's one more spot right here for oil. And then whenever I'm going to oil it, I will just... Well, I can't run it all the way down right now because my drill's in there, but if the drill bit wasn't in there, I'd run it all the way down. I'd go ahead and, you know, put a lot of oil right in there and then run it back up and that lubricates the spindle. <clears throat> and then I put oil on the uh, bearing plate right here where it meshes with the two races. All right. The only other thing that you need to do for maintenance lubrication wise is grease. <clears throat> now I, as if a head, and by a head I mean this whole assembly would be called a head unit, right? So <clears throat> since this head is not inside a, a gearbox, if it's inside a gearbox, kind of like, uh, like, your, like your engine in your car, 
if it's not in, it's usually in, um, in, an, in, a, in some kind of gearbox full of oil. But since it's not, you want to put something on there that's going to lubricate it. It's going to stay there. Uh, oil, even thick oil. Uh, you could use some thick oil like the 140 weight on it. But I chose to go with uh, grease. I went with the marine grease. Uh, put a liberal amount on there. I ran it at high speed, sort of, and uh, wiped away the excess. I still have some, some excess that I'll be wiping away, but it's lubed up. Uh, you have four gears. Don't forget, all four gears uh, need to be uh, lubricated. This is not a gear, so it doesn't get lubed up. In fact, it's still painted. Uh, as you see here, I, I, my drill, the only piece that was missing uh, was the handle. So I need to make a handle for it, uh, but in the meantime, I just shoved a dowel in there so I could use it. So I could operate this. And <clears throat> just uh, for clarification, if you wanted to drill, like I said, these are primarily used for metal um, with the auto feed. If you want to use it for wood, or if you wanted to be in complete control, um, if you wanted to be in complete control of drilling through metal, and what I mean by that is, if you have it set up like this, you crank this and you're just going. You're going a certain specific speed and you're going a certain specific feed. You can't speed up or slow down your feed like you would on a drill press. You know, you turn it on, it's going 500 RPM, whatever, and you start feeding down by hand, you can kind of peck it, <clears throat> and you can control the feed and the pressure that's being put on that drill bit. <clears throat> With this machine, you can't. If the auto, paw, auto advanced paw is engaged with your feed wheel, right? So, <clears throat> when you crank, it's going to feed. And it's going to feed at whatever rate you set it at. Now, again, you can go, you can adjust your speed and you can adjust your feed, but you don't have independent control of your feed while you're turning the drill. <clears throat> um, the only way to do that would be to disengage the paw and then you can go in this way or you can, you know, come out. But going in and just kind of working it like this is how you would do it by hand, do the feed by hand. And that's how you would normally do if you're drilling through wood, because you're going to go through wood a whole lot faster than you are metal. <clears throat> you would just crank it and just feed it in by hand. See what I'm saying? So I hope that helped some people out. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, what else? Uh, I already went over the chuck, <clears throat> but I went, uh, I went with a, let's see, it's called a, the company is Harvest. <clears throat> it is a keyless chuck that I didn't have tight. I just spit my drill bit out. All right. All right. <clears throat> it's a keyless chuck, and it goes from one thirty seconds all the way up to five eighths. That's the uh, the thickness uh, of shank that it'll accept. Uh, if you go with the regular chuck, it's got a fixed half inch shank, so all of your drill bits have to be half inch. Now, I just happen to have sets for both wood and metal that will do that, but uh, I don't. I, I want to be able to use any drill bit that I need in this application. Um, so I went with uh, a keyless chuck. And I didn't know anything about this chuck. Uh, it's just kind of going by what I know. I've been a machinist for 25 years, so I kind of went with what I thought looked good. And I was kind of skeptical about the quality and the beefiness of it when it came in. 
or before it came in, but once it did arrive, I saw it, I felt it, I played with it, I, the craftsmanship's top notch, and uh, I mean, you can't beat it for the price. It's not a Jacob's Chuck. Um, thank God, because those prices are outrageous. Uh, but um, it's, in my opinion, just as good as a Jacob's Chuck so far. Uh, it's great. <clears throat> Can't say enough good stuff about it. Just make sure that you get uh, half-inch straight shank when you order these, if you, if you do go to order them. Uh, I think I picked mine up on eBay or Amazon or something. Um, yeah, that's enough about the chuck. Um, I have not done the long table uh, bar yet. I, ex I plan on doing a, a three-foot bar so that I can put more... Um, so that I can put more... Uh, I can put thicker pieces in between the, uh, um, you know, put more thicker pieces, bigger pieces on the table and be able to drill with, uh, without doing other things. <clears throat> uh, but I haven't been able to do that yet. That's why my table or my, my base is so long. This is eventually it's going to be accepting a three foot, one foot longer than what it already is, uh, bar. That the table rides along up and down on um, once I do get that then the two mounting holes that I used for <clears throat> the foot the way it is with the two foot bar I'll just use those as mounting bolts when I mount it to the post so you won't see any holes if I decide to use other bolts or other holes uh, for mounting it to the post then uh, you know, I just plug those with wood and you never know the difference. <clears throat> um, last thing is the demo. So, let's see if I can get this right. Get right down on the action here. <laughs> I don't know how well this is going to work, but we'll see. So you just stick a, stick your bar in there, whatever you're, whatever you're drilling. <clears throat> and I'll just uh, t undo the paw and uh, move it in by hand until it just touches off. And then I'll back it off a hair so that I'm feeding into it. <clears throat> and right now I have it set on slow speed and two clicks of advancement right now. And I just run it. You see how slow it is, how, how much it's turned already and it has, it's just barely now touching off. And just like any drill, and it's going by itself right now. That's that flywheel. You're going to uh, lube up your hole. Pull in, lube, something. You'll see, once it starts biting, it'll start spitting out a chip. And you see that chip curling out right now. Now I just thought of something. I don't want uh, what I don't want to do is drill through my table. There's no hole in the middle of this one for some reason. So I'm gonna back it out slightly. Just releasing the pressure a little bit. <clears throat> and I'm going to 
it's going to line up with that hole or not. See, it doesn't really leave you with a whole lot of room. I'll tell you what we'll do. Mount it just a little bit lower. See if I can line that guy up. And there we go, that'll work. <clears throat> now we got some wood under there. Engage that paw again. That's it. And just disengage it. And while we're down here, even though this is not a wood bit, we'll go ahead and <clears throat> I haven't tried it yet. It's just in theory, only I know. And drill the wood. Of course you'd need something to clamp it with. Just throw a quick clamp on there. Quick as you want. Oh, I'm at the end of my. <laughs> it's already through, and I'm at my table. So there you go. Drilled that super fast. can't see it all the way through and I don't want to get chips everywhere but <clears throat> drill a hole in the wood. Of course we knew it would do both before we even started so not sure why we <laughs> why we like to do these kind of things but uh, I'm sure you guys all understand or you wouldn't be sitting here watching this video with me. <clears throat> it's already 30 minutes long and uh, you know <clears throat> um, I get asked a lot and I'm going to kind of, right, so why hand tools? Why these old tools? Why do I restore, bring life back to these old tools and don't do anything with electrical, you know, with electric power, you know, power tools. <clears throat> Well, it's all stemming because I am getting ready to make a humongous move, right? 2018, uh, <clears throat> which today is January 1st, 2018. Happy New Year again, if I didn't say it already. Um, 2018 is going to mark the year of my retirement from the United States Navy. It'll be almost uh, 24 years and uh, I'm going to be making some drastic life changes. <clears throat> um, 
The biggest reason, though, is for going with the hand tools is, for one, for me, it's romantic to go back and you don't, it's, I don't know, it's hard to explain. <clears throat> if you've never done it, then you'll, you'll never do it. Or if you, if you have never done it and you think uh, it's ridiculous, then, well, I don't know why you're still watching this video. <laughs> But <clears throat> if you have done it, you know what I'm talking about. It's very uh, soothing, relaxing. Uh, there's a lot of fulfillment and enjoyment with working with hand tools the way that craftsmen did, you know, 100, 200 years ago. It's just, and even longer with, you know, when talking about woodworking and stuff of that nature uh, with nothing but hand tools. <clears throat> It's pretty rewarding and it's, uh, it's sexy, it's romantic. I love it. Um, <clears throat> and these major lifestyle changes that I'm getting ready to make, I'm gonna be making them uh, because my power is gonna be very, very limited. Uh, if I even decide to have power at all, I'm, I'm planning on having some sort of power and I'll get to that in just a second, but um, it's going to make more sense. I'll be so remote and relying on if I have power, it's going to be something that I've generated, solar, wind, or hydro, <clears throat> that I really don't, I don't want to waste that energy on the tools that I don't want to be using to begin with, if that makes any sense. Um, <clears throat> so, for me, retirement is freedom, straight up freedom, freedom to do what I want, when I want, how I want, with whom I want, freedom. And I just, I just can't wait, can't wait. Uh, for the first, uh, initially, for the first couple of years, <clears throat> the plan is to, I have 243 days left in the Navy. And uh, so the first week's, week of September, <clears throat> I am going to be uh, moving, doing my final, I'll be leaving here and going to Indiana for the first couple of years. And why not just jump into it right away? Well, there's a lot of different reasons. I have to finalize the design and the planning of my homestead, which it's pretty intense. I could just jump right into it, buy a plot of land, and just go for it. But I want to use my brain. I'm old enough, wise enough now to know not to just jump right into it. Um, <clears throat> if I don't have to, right? And right now I don't have to. I still got nine months-ish left until, uh, until I'm retired. And I'm still giving myself another two years uh, before the start of the build um, to finish, to get ready, to prepare. I got to prepare mentally, financially. I got to let my finances settle out where my retirement pension's coming in. Um, <clears throat> I know exactly what I've got. I got to get medical stuff situated, medical, dental. Um, <clears throat> but realistically, I just I, there's other things that I want too. I want to be able to relax. And enjoy just being retired and not having to go to work every day. God, how amazing is that, right? Um, I'm gonna. I plan on building a lot of structures on the property that uh, that I'll be at, and that'll be for practice. I'll have other projects as well, <clears throat> but it'll be practice. That way, you know, it won't be the first time I've uh, when I go to build my workshop, my cabin, and my other buildings. It's uh, it's not going to be the first time I've ever done that structure or, you know, built a massive structure like that. We're going to be building big pole barns, timber frame sheds, workshops, all kind of stuff on the property I'm going to. And uh, all those projects are going to do nothing but strengthen my skill and my knowledge and experience and make my homestead final project, a, um, <clears throat> a 
final product uh, that I can be happy with, that I'll be pleased with, and I won't be kicking myself in the ass thinking, oh, I should have done it this way, or I should have done it that way, and what if I would have practiced, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, other things, I have to, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of things <clears throat> that go into uh, planning to homestead, planning, I got to buy land, right? I have to find the right piece of land. I plan on having, I'm kind of getting into this a little early, but I plan on having two, uh, two properties, one in the Appalachians and one in the Rockies, or as you're looking at it, one in the Apps and one in the Rockies. Um, but <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff that goes into it, especially for my primary residence, which is going to be uh, in the apps. Uh, the Rockies is going to be more of a uh, soul seeking place, a hunting place, you know, a winter cabin, a getaway, whatever you want to call it. It's going to be like straight up, absolutely off the grid. No power whatsoever. When the sun goes down, you find something to do by candlelight, by the fireplace, something like that. There's no cell phones, no computers, no nothing ever will be out at that place. Uh, you shit in the woods. You drink water from the creek. That's, or from the spring if you're lucky enough. That's going to be the cabin up in the Northwest, and that's going to be Wyoming, Montana, Idaho area. Um, <clears throat> this place that my, my primary residence is going to be, uh, I'm looking at properties anywhere from like East Central Kentucky all the way up into Southern Pennsylvania obviously including West Virginia in there. Kentucky's looking like the winter right now. I'm trying to get as north as I can because I need snow uh, for my sake, for my soul to stay alive. I need snow. Um, but, you know, then again, I'll have the, eventually I'll have the, uh, the second cabin up in the northwest and there'll definitely be snow up there. Um, <clears throat> so maybe that's, uh, Maybe that's something else I need to look at. <clears throat> um, open my range of options anyway, uh, going a little bit further south, knowing I have the other place up there or will um, for the snow, for trapping and hunting and whatnot. <clears throat> um, the primary residence, though, I'm looking in that area. Uh, I like the area. I'm moving to that area for a specific reason. I'm not going to get into the details on that, but that's the area of the country that um, that I have decided is the right place for me. And <clears throat> Kentucky, it's like Kentucky is, I'm going to do this as y'all are looking at it, Kentucky is the cheapest land of the three states that I'm looking at. So you got Kentucky, you can get land there dirt cheap, man. Like you get on land watch, you can find a couple speckled ones where you can get 60, 70 acres for 40 or $50,000. And, and well, it's not dirt cheap, but it's, a, it's cheap. That's pretty cheap for these days. Um, and it's most of it looks like good land and a good remote area. Uh, but you can easily get 30 to 50 acres with 50 grand. Uh, no, no sweat. No sweat in Kentucky. You start getting into West Virginia, certain parts of West Virginia, you can kind of get those parts, but those, those prices. But as you move further north, it starts to get a little more expensive. And once you get into Pennsylvania, you'd be lucky if you get 10 acres. Lucky if you get 10 acres. Uh, with 50 grand. Um, that's not what I'm capping out at at 50 grand, but I want to I want to I want to keep as much of my nest egg that I've got already uh, Without blowing, you know, I don't want to blow my whole wad on a big chunk of land 
Um, I'm going to obvious, I don't plan on having a whole lot of expenses uh, in the building of my primary residence in the apps, but um, I'm not stupid either. Things are going to come up and I'm going to need money for one thing or another, whether it's building or just whatever. Surviving <clears throat> while I'm trying to build um, and living in comfortably, that stuff takes money. Um, so let's get, let's get, uh, okay. So I also have to, in that two years, I have to finish building things and restoring things that I'm going to need to build. Right. So I can use that time wisely. Uh, I need to build a, a saw bench, uh, for all my crosscut saws. Uh, I need to make a bunch of tooling. I need to restore uh, my, they're beautiful the way they are, but they're going to be more beautiful when I'm done. Um, my beam drills, <clears throat> um, there's a lot of things I have to fine tune my, all my slicks and get them just right. And there's a lot of things that go into it and a lot of, a lot of things need to be done. I need to do a lot of, you know, tune up my, all my tooling, make the tooling I need things of that nature. Um, but I also need to finalize the, you know, finalize the, the physical plans for the homestead. You know, what style of home am I looking for? What style of, what building style am I going to go with? Am I going to go with dovetail, you know, like a half dovetail, full dovetail, V-notch log cabin, like a hewn log cabin. That's what I'm, that's what I'm leaning towards. Um, <clears throat> am I going to want to do a round log scribed cabin? Uh, I, I'm using the wrong words. The hewn log is technically a, a log house. And then the cabin would be with the round logs. Um, or do I do timber frame? I'm thinking a lot of different things. And these are the decisions that I'm going to have to make over that two years. Um, I, at first I thought about doing timber frame workshop, then build the, the cabin and all the other buildings however I want. No big deal. But if I try to incorporate the workshop into like a, you know, a big woodworking shop into the homestead, we'll call it homestead proper, then I want it to be something that works with the other buildings that are going to be in that group of buildings. <clears throat> it's kind of hard to explain this because in my head I've got it all writ I've got it all drawn up of certain ways that I want things. And some of it works well with certain building styles and some works well well with other building styles. Um I'm tossing a lot of different options around in my head. So, <clears throat> so that's that. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot to think about. <clears throat> so I have to finalize the, uh, the physical plans of the property. <clears throat> of course, uh, when it comes to how that exactly is going to get laid out, you know, the, the, the actuality, the reality of how it gets laid out and the foundations that are going to be built for that, um, for that layout, <clears throat> as well as uh, my electricity and my water and all that stuff. We're still talking about the apps, the Appalachian uh, uh, homestead. Uh, my water, <clears throat> my electricity, all that stuff is going to be geared on the property. Does the property have, is it going to be at the top of a hill where I have wind? Am I going to be able to harness the wind? Is it going to be on the north face or the south face? Or in Kentucky, it really probably doesn't even matter. Uh, am I going to have a lot of solar? Is, am I going to have to cut a bunch of trees down to get the sun to come in to hit solar panels? Uh, is there going to be a creek or a river or something where I can run uh, hydro power 
to power up generators and other shop machinery and such. That's all going to be dictated off of uh, off the land and my water <clears throat> for power. My water, my drinking water, is there going to be a spring? Am I going to have to dig a well? If I'm on the side of a mountain, can I even dig a well? Is it even going to work? You know what I mean? Um, these are all the things that have to be considered. When I go to look for that property, it has to it has to incorporate a lot of different things. Um, so the things that, that come to mind uh, immediately and I wrote down on my list was it needs to have a spring for my water. It needs to have good game, hunting game, and fish for my food. So now I got my water and my food taken care of. Uh, it has to have good timber, right? <laughs> Hello, I'm a woodworker. It's got to have good timber, and I want a good variety of timber. I don't want just a bunch of new saplings around. You know, I want good, mature trees, oaks, poplars, mesquites, walnuts, right? <clears throat> um, with some, you know, other stuff would be good too, some softwoods, but I want a variety. Up here, I look outside, I got Douglas fir, Douglas fir, or pine, or some Douglas fir. You know what I'm saying? That's all we got out here. <clears throat> oh, and we have Douglas fir too. <clears throat> so I want some hardwoods in there. Maple, some good, well, we do have a little bit of maple up here, but it's kind of shitty, really. Um, I want a creek. I want, or some kind of river, some flowing water. Not no, I'm not going to, you know, build my house near the Mississippi or anything like that. Probably it's in the wrong part of the country for that. But you get what I'm saying. I don't want to build on a major river. I just want a lot, you know, it'd be nice to have a, a substantial river going through it. That would be prime for, really would be prime as a nice, a nice creek that's like, I don't know less than 10 yards wide I'm kind of dreaming now <clears throat> um, what else uh, I would I want a property obviously that has that but it also has to have high ground uh, it'd be nice to have some flat earth spots to uh, to build on um, I need to have mountains must have mountains must have mountains uh, it's got to have good soil uh, I plan on building one of the build one of the structures I plan on building in the in the in the uh, <clears throat> in the homestead is a greenhouse, but I also want to have you know I'm going so that's the planting the gardening and whatnot that I'm going to be doing for most of my food, but I'm going to have some things that are going to be growing outside. Um, they're just too big for a greenhouse and I want to be able to grow those outside in good fertile soil and also with that if you're a hunter um, now I haven't been hunting for that long or anything but <clears throat> um, when it comes to hunting uh, one thing that I have been taught and I've learned from seeing everybody do it and what we do on our land out uh, in Indiana is food plots um, like if you plant it, they will come, right? Uh, you plant corn, you plant brassicas, clover, whatever you're gonna plant, you gotta plant it, and you plant it, and then you you know you hunt those fields if you want. <clears throat> uh, but the deer, the elk, moose, whatever you're going to be, they're all gonna come feed on your fields. Now you could use a feeder, but that's illegal in most states. Uh, and just spit out corn on the ground and it's like candy for them and they come and eat it or whatever and you shoot them but uh, anyways plots food plots for hunting food the food for my food you need good soil for that and <clears throat> the last thing that came to mind uh, right off the bat and I have a whole I have three full pages front and back of stuff that I need to consider when buying land that I have thought about uh, endlessly. Um, but the last thing is it has to be remote. The good thing for me is that 
um, unless you're talking about prime, prime, prime real estate, the further away from town that you get, the cheaper the property is. That's good for me because I don't want to, I, the first thing that I do, I look at a piece of property like, ooh, that's a lot of, you know, I'm getting a lot of bang for the buck. You know, maybe 70 acres for 40 grand or something like that. And then you click on it and it's like, it's like, it's too close to town for me. If I'm like 15, 20 minutes from town, that's too close. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's just the short, the short end of the short story is that's too close for me. I want to be remote. I want to, I don't want anybody. I want to get, I'm looking for 50 to a hundred acres and I'm going to, I'm going to put, I'm going to be right smack in the middle of it. Um, but then there's, there's other things that I want to consider too. Like you have the river. I'm going to be close enough to a river or the creek that I can use it. And I don't have to walk, you know, I don't have to cross five acres of land to get to the river. I want to, I want to, I'm going to build relatively, you know, pretty close to the river or the creek or whatever this water that's running through my, my place. And I don't want to build too far away from the spring. So it, all those things kind of dictate where I place the house, but I don't want it, you know, I want my land to surround me by a good, by a good bit. <clears throat> uh, the structures that I plan on building on my homestead, um, well, first thing I'm going to build is my workshop. Whatever that turns out being, the workshop is going to be the first thing that I build. And <clears throat> uh, the I'm about 95% sure on the workshop. I'm looking at a fairly large uh, timber frame. <clears throat> And I say that because the timber frame theoretically would go up quicker, a little bit quicker. Uh, obviously, you don't have to hew and uh, you don't have to hew a notch <laughs> nearly as many uh, logs as you would if you're doing a um, a building that has nothing but log walls. Um, <clears throat> so it should go up a little bit quicker. I'll be able to do a much larger space. And that's the, the big key here is being able to do a, you know, if I wanted to, to do an enormous workshop, then <clears throat> I could basically build a log cabin inside of that workshop and then, you know, notch the numbers in it and move it somewhere and build, you know, build it up, put it on a foundation somewhere else on the property. <clears throat> but I can do a big, large, you know, a really large space like that um, where I can, I can do big work inside that shop as well, which I, I won't have that option really doing a log, you know, a, a true like log home. Uh, without having walls and stuff like that that you have to incorporate into such a large structure. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I can go massive with a timber frame where I can't with a log home. Log, you know, a log home. Um, where was I? Okay, so I'm going to build a workshop. Probably, probably almost positive timber frame workshop. Big one. And I'm thinking about putting it a little bit further away, you know, where I got like a, a five minute walk to get to the workshop from where my how my homestead is. <clears throat> um, there's a reason for that, but that's what I'm looking at. The second thing that I'm going to build is my primary residence, my home, uh, my house. 99% um, <clears throat> sure I'm going to do that with a half dovetail log home. Uh, style is yet to be determined, <clears throat> but it's probably going to be mm, somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six pin log house. 
Um, it is going to be large because this house is going to be in the past down. It's, I mean, yeah, it's me kind of a hermit or whatever, right? But uh, my house, the property, everything, when it's all said and done, still is going to stay in the family. And, you know, it'll be given to my to my kids and my grandkids and they'll be raising, you know, hopefully if they want to or whatever, they can raise their families in the house. <clears throat> And if not, they can sell it, and this way it's more sellable. Uh, you know, a little tiny one-pin uh, log cabin is not going to be worth squat uh, to the to the family that's got three kids, two, you know, uh, or, or what is it, two kids, one and a half dogs, and white picket fence, the whole thing. They're not going to want that. They're going to want three or four bedrooms, you know, all this kind of jazz, right? <clears throat> um, so I'm going to be building, it's going to be kind of large. <clears throat> Larger anyway. Yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Um, other buildings which are, are completely undecided on style of building style and things of that nature is uh, for the most part <clears throat> uh, is the forge I'm gonna have a forge uh, strictly for nothing but blacksmithing it'll, be, it'll have a, a nice um, a nice solid permanent forge area uh, uh, what do you what it'll have a you know a of, of uh, <laughs> a vent hood uh, that will be flued out all the way through the top with uh, chimney for lack of a better term uh, I'm also going to be building a greenhouse it'll be a fairly large greenhouse <clears throat> um, the greenhouse will for obvious reasons need to be not a log cabin but it'll probably be a timber frame also uh, there will be a lot of uh, translucent materials used. Uh, like Again, obvious reasons, I think. Um, I'm going to be building a root cellar. So the root cellar is going to be where I store all my food. Uh, both of them, you know, all my preserved meat, canned goods, vegetables, and, and fruits, and jams, and all that stuff. <clears throat> it's all going, all my dry goods, it's all going to be in the root cellar. And that's going to be, that'll actually end up, I think, in, in my head anyways, it's going to look more like a little, like a little hobbit house. <laughs> But if everything turns out right, it should be it should be on point. Um, <clears throat> what else? Uh, I'm gonna have a a some kind of structure that's going to store wood, not only firewood, uh, but it's also gonna store all the lumber that I mill up for uh, for woodworking and building other structures and such. So that that might actually come s that might actually go alongside with the um, with the workshop so that might actually be tied into the build of the workshop because obviously I'm gonna need heat I'm gonna need heat and I'm gonna heat with firewood and I'm gonna need a place to store all my timbers while I'm building my cabin and everything so that'll probably be uh, built at the same time as the uh, as the workshop um, <clears throat> and the last building, the last structure that I can, other than maybe a garage, like for, you know, all things with engines and things of that nature, grease monkey type stuff, I'll probably have some kind of thing for that. And, <clears throat> you know, so I could just like pull my tractor in, whatever, quads, work on quads and trucks, you know, whatever I'm going to do. And, uh... But the last, the last building I'm going to be building is somewhere where I can process meat. I can hang a hang an elk in there and uh, 
gut it, skin it, butcher it, package it and everything. And then uh, the last piece of that puzzle is uh, <clears throat> a smokehouse kind of tagged to it where I can preserve my meat. Uh, and somehow tie in a, uh, I gotta have a, some way of tanning the hides. Um, and so onto that kind of a side shop to that will be where I can, you know, process the furs and things of that nature. So I can, you know, make, I'll be ended up making my own clothing and stuff out of the furs from the game that I, I, uh, harvest. <clears throat> um, I think I covered everything on that. Uh, and again, all this is, a lot of this stuff is just still so fluid. And that's the whole reason I'm taking so much time off before I start is to get my brain wrapped around this whole thing. It's going to be massive. Um, the first homestead I expect to take me about five years. Uh, and why five years? Because I'm the cordless carpenter. Come on. The whole thing, start to finish, is done with no power tools, all hand tools, by me. I'm not going to really have, I'll, I'll have help from time to time, uh, just because, just because. But most of the, uh, the vast, vast majority of the project is going to be built solely by me. Especially the cabin. The cabin will be built specifically just by me. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of a way of uh, me helping inspire other people that are like me. They're reaching out for their dreams. They're single guys. They don't want to have nothing to do with relationships or anything like that no more. They just want to go live their life in the woods and be left alone. Um, that way this will inspire them hopefully and, and make it, uh, conclusive that yes, they can do it, uh, and they can build it by themselves without power. Um, one book, <clears throat> one book that's going to make that possible um, have, I've done so much research on this, uh, doing this by myself alone in the woods and the mountains. I've done so much homework on it already that I feel like it's like, it's already done. It's in my head. It's already done. Um, confidence wise, <clears throat> but I wouldn't have been able to get this far without the knowledge that I've learned. I've, I've gotten a few just on point nuggets that are going to help me with my build. And I will share those nuggets with you guys uh, as I go through that process. But something that I've, I've become a, uh, I've become, and I, I'm, I need to email him again because it's been a little while, but um, Josh, <clears throat> um, you all, if y'all are watching my channel, y'all probably know him more better as uh, uh, Mr. Chickadee. Uh, he and I have become um, pretty good correspondents uh, online. We'll just put it that way. We have many, many emails, and he's helped me out tremendously. And one of the things that he recommended I get uh, that I've been reading through is this booger. Right? So this is going to help me understand some of the ways and if you've watched his i mean it goes over simple machines rigging leverage uh <clears throat> pulleys uh just all kinds of different things that are going to be very very helpful you know building scaffolding to building cranes and i mean it's crazy they've done all the homework for you right all of your formulas and everything it's Everything's laid out right there. I mean, it's all done for you. Um, one of the things, the reason to spark this was I saw, let's see if I can flip to it and I know what section of the book it's in. 
was <clears throat> basically building shears or boom derricks, right? Because <clears throat> you see that on his channel. He built, I was like, where the heck did you get that? Like, where can I get the, uh, you know, what size logs for what length? And, you know, well, that's, um, you know, I just, I didn't even think about that. He watches videos on this rigging and his capstan build and all that. And you're like, wow, you really can do anything if you just put your damn mind to it. And I'll tell you, man, I've, I've found some good nuggets on the internet too that I'm going to share with you that. I wouldn't have even thought of if I hadn't seen that, um, or at least not right away. But that, and if you're thinking about building a a log house, a hand-hewn log house, and you haven't bought this, uh, I'm deep into it now. I haven't finished it yet, but I'm pretty deep into it. This book right here. Get it. If you're looking at building a hand hewn log home by this book all right if you have any questions about what's going to happen feel free ask me the question i will answer you um if you're digging what i'm doing give me a thumbs up subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet uh, I will start putting out more regular videos, especially once I retire. They'll be like all the time. And when I retire, I'll have all the time in the world to learn how to edit video. I'll get some, I'm going to get some, the plan is anyway, because I'm going to, I am going to, um, I'm going to document all this build from my retirement out on the homestead and all the projects in between and everything. I'm going to document them all on video. I'm going to edit the video. I'm going to have the video. If YouTube's still around and it's you know still doing this thing, great. I'll post them on YouTube for you guys or whatever, Patreon or what, whatever venue format that I can get it out to you guys. Share it with, uh, share the experience with the world. I'll do that. I'm going to have nice, nice, but if not, I have, you know, I'll have the, uh, I'll have the document for me, you know. <clears throat> I'll have the uh, the video footage um, for my own personal library of footage or whatever to document the whole process. But also future generations of mine will be able to see the footage. They can share it with future owners of the property or whatever. And it'll all be laid out. Like, yeah, this house is built this year. Uh, by this guy, it took this long, and these were the, you know, all that stuff will be documented, all video. And I'll be journaling, um, you know, handwritten journals uh, through the entire process. It's going to be amazing. Um, but I'm going to have nice camera gear. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy some nice cameras. I'm going to learn how to do this whole video and editing and all that jazz and and uh, maybe my, my videos won't be uh, an hour and 10 minutes long. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you have any questions, if you're curious about anything that I plan on doing at the homestead, if you're curious about anything uh, with the drill restoration or rest, uh, any of my videos, ask. I'll answer your questions. Um, I think that's about it. I'm going to wrap it up before it hits the 110 mark. <laughs> All right. If you're digging what I'm doing, give me a thumbs up. Friends and family, I love you. Everyone else, check back soon. I'll post another video. Till then, I'll be seeing you.